All right. So good evening. Thanks to those of you who are taking the time to watch. I appreciate it. Welcome to our workshop on May it please the court. Uh, let me share my screen. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> this workshop on May it please the court is uh, focused on exploring the interaction between the U.S. Supreme Court and federal, state, and or local policy and political institutions, actors, and behaviors. The live Zoom is held uh, today, Tuesdays, from 8 to 8.30. Uh, and you can watch the prior ones by going to the recording uh, when it's available. So let me just put a note, watch recording for this one once it comes up. All right, so we're going to jump right back into our uh, first case of this uh, workshop. And this is the case of Mississippi versus Tennessee. Now, recall that there were some questions associated with this case, so I'm going to bring those back up. Uh, and for this case, the two questions that the Supreme Court is being asked to answer is first, does Mississippi have sole sovereign authority over and control of groundwater naturally stored within its borders? And then the second question, is Mississippi entitled to damages, injunctive, and other equitable relief for the groundwater taken by Tennessee? So we already listened to the first 45 minutes or so of this case. I'm going to go ahead and jump us to that part uh, right around here. And we'll go ahead and get, we'll get listening in. I'm still nervous about the question. That... And actually, let me set up my audio a little different. Apologies. And if you just give me a thumbs up, if you can hear, that'd be great. Uh, Justice Gorsuch is asking, I mean, the groundwater every, under every state, I mean, every state will start suing each other, except maybe Hawaii or, or Alaska. Uh, and uh, I, we haven't seen a lot of cases like that. And my, my thought then is what you think about is maybe it could be done, but maybe it's better left to compacts or to Congress. Uh, and should we say anything about amendment? That's where, the, that's where uh, we have to decide something here, because anything we say, of course, they have a right to ask to amend. Yes. But uh, if we say a word about it, that's going to be taken, as this is a, a totally appropriate kind of suit and the wild horses we worry about later. And, and uh, uh, I don't know where it's going. Well, Justice Breyer, two points in response to your question. One, I think their approach spawns much more litigation than our approach. Equitable apportionment is about sharing. It's about sharing scarce resources when those resources become scarce. It's not about money grabs because of the way that flow has been affected by pumping. And, Chief Justice, you asked about Tennessee counterclaims. But Dr. Waldron testified that there was a significant tens of millions of, of gallons of water every day that was flowing into Tennessee and out of Tennessee and into Memphis and in, in, in into Mississippi. And so what the evidence at trial would show would be that there would be substantial counterclaims if that were the standard. And that's why we respectfully suggest it should not be the standard. Now, with respect to the fact that aquifers are under many, many states, in fact, most of the states in the country, respectfully, the question ought to be, is there scarcity? And if there is scarcity, is there a doctrine that – calls for conservation, calls for historic uses, calls for weighing the harms and benefits, calls for prospective action that would enable the scarce resource to be shared, mm -hmm. and the answer is yes. Well, maybe we should just wait uh, to decide that matter, which could lead to all kinds of lawsuits, until we have to decide it. You could, but what I think you should say is that this is indisputably an interstate water resource in which there is flow, if there is a remedy, it falls under the equitable apportionment doctrine. Mississippi has disclaimed an equitable apportionment claim. Therefore, its complaint should be dismissed, period. And not specify with or without prejudice for leave to amend. Just say I nothing? I, I, I thought I just captured what I think is the appropriate disposition. I, they haven't moved to amend their complaint. They've been very careful not to say whether they plan to do it. Their entire gambit here has been to get Tennessee to pay them hundreds of millions of dollars for water that, in part, they have intercepted at the boundary. So it's not — and they say this on page 36 of the blue brief. They do not claim that Tennessee is taking out more than its fair share of the water. That's not their claim. Their claim is that they think they have an ownership right that entitles them to charge Tennessee for water. And that, we think, the Court should say, 
no, that's not the correct statement of the law. Shouldn't the dismissal be without prejudice to them filing an equitable apportionment action? Uh, it would seem extreme to me to bar them uh, from doing so in the future. Justice Kavanaugh, I think that the correct disposition would be to dismiss this complaint, their territorial ownership claim, with prejudice. And I would urge the Court to do that, to disincentivize any other state from seeking what, what, to eliminate. Sorry to interrupt. What would the effects of that be on their ability to file an equitable apportionment claim, even if they can't show material change in circumstances? You would address that at the motion for leave to file a new complaint, where they would be put to their burden to show that there's been a material change and there has been a significant injury of serious magnitude, and Tennessee would respond depending on what they pleaded in their uh, new complaint. Uh, Mr. Frederick, uh, thank you. Uh, I've had a little trouble following the science uh, here. Uh, is this really water we're talking about? I yes. mean, it's complete. Well, it's mixed up with silt and small particles and all. Uh, um, if you you could put it in your hand, right, and it would be silt. It would be wet. But until you pump it, it's really not the water, right? But no. The definition of an aquifer is a fully saturated formation, hydrogeological formation, in which there are usable quantities of water. Yeah, yeah, I read that. But fully saturated means it's saturating something. Right? Yes, it's sand. It's not mostly. like a le- sand. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, w- w- someone explained to me it's like you're in the, sh- the side of the shore and you put your foot down and you lift it up. It kind of fills with water in that gap, right? Uh, that is uh, descriptive of parts of the aquifer. Well, yes. it's the part that I could understand. <laughs> uh, so, so why should we view it as like just like our interstate water cases? I mean, it is an unnatural operation of the pumping separates out the water, and at that point, it's, it's usable. For but the, before that, you would just call it silt, and if somebody showed you, you know, a handful of silt, they wouldn't say, oh, that's water. Well, Mr. Chief Justice, I think you would say that it is water because it's some of the finest water that anyone can drink in the United States. This artesian water is absolutely spectacular water that they have pumped, and they have run it over filters that filter out some of the iron and some of the other minerals. But it is um, uh, very pure water, and it is delicious. And I would urge the Court to consider that aquifer, just because it is it is mixed in with sediment, does not distinguish what it actually is, which is water when it is pulled out, and it is not a sophisticated scientific operation to do that. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Justice Thomas? Justice Breyer? Justice Alito? Mr. Frederick, on the the question of leave to amend, um, just to nail that down, would, would you have any objection to this Court simply resolving the case as before us and saying that there is no leave to amend currently pending before us. We don't need to address it. The special master was erroneous to the extent that he suggested there was. We, that, if with that last part, Justice Gorsuch, we would have no objection to that. Okay. Justice Kavanaugh? No further questions. Justice Barrett? I do have one question. Following up on the Chief's uh, question to you about separating the water from the silt, What if you could separate out some other thing from the silt, like some sort of mineral, and find some sort of way to pump it and pull it into Tennessee? How would that fare? Would that be subject to equitable apportionment? No, Your Honor. Uh, Minerals have not been subjected to the equitable apportionment doctrine because they're not covered by public trust. They are privately owned usually through surface ownership rights by personal property. Sometimes they get severed in some states where you can own the surface land and sever off the mineral rights. Those would be treated separately under uh, well-established law. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Mr. Liu. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. Under Mississippi's theory of this case, Certain groundwater belongs to Mississippi simply by virtue of having passed through Mississippi's territory. There is no support for such a theory. Indeed, Mississippi can't point to a single jurisdiction that has ever allocated groundwater based on such a theory. This Court, when confronted with disputes over the allocation of interstate resources, has applied the doctrine of equitable apportionment 
That doctrine represents the most sensible way of allocating an interstate resource because it respects the equal sovereignty of the states. And Mississippi identifies no reason why that doctrine should govern interstate surface water and fish, but not the groundwater at issue here. Mississippi's exceptions to the special master's report should therefore be overruled. I welcome the court, the court's questions. Uh, well, counsel, um, uh, you say on page 18 of your brief that, uh, Mississippi's case uh, is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from, from or at least sufficiently similar to all the Court's prior precedents uh, because it's groundwater that it crosses acro- across state lines uh, uh, and affects the other state. Uh, but there are a lot of other ways in which it's distinguishable. Uh, the fact that we are just talking about that it's, however, Delicious it might be when you get the silt out of it. It's not too good when the silt's uh, uh, in it. And the fact that it's groundwater. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, uh, this is a case of first impression, isn't it? You really are trying to move this beyond the flowing water and the fish. Well, it, it's true that this Court has not addressed directly the question of how to deal with the allocation of water in an aquifer. Our point is that this Court's prior precedents have identified two characteristics of the resources at issues in those cases that uh, justify the application of the doctrine of equitable apportionment. And in this case, those two characteristics, that is, the resource moving naturally across state lines and the fact that one state's use of the resource within its borders affects the presence of the resource in the other, those two characteristics are present here. At least they're sufficiently similar. And so while there are certainly differences between groundwater and surface water, those are the those are the two differences that matter. And they matter because when those characteristics are satisfied, that's when the doctrine of equitable apportionment makes sense. When those characteristics exist, you're inevitably going to have a conflict of sovereign interests, of, on the one hand, the sovereign interests of the state's right to use the water here in, uh, in Tennessee, and, of course, the, so- the, the interest of the other sovereign to protect its citizens from whatever effects that use may have. And because one state can't simply impose its policy on the other, the doctrine of equal apportionment does what the best we can do, which is to treat each state as an equal sovereign, take account of all their interests, put both states' balance, uh, both states' interests on the balance, and then rec- reconcile them as best as we can. M- Mr. Liu, suppose that instead of drilling their wells straight down, Tennessee drilled its wells like on a slant. Right. So that, in fact, the wells did cross the boundary between Tennessee and Mississippi. Is it then an equitable apportionment claim, or at that point, does Mississippi have a different kind of action? Well, I want to be clear about what we think the domain of equitable apportionment is. We think this doctrine applies when one state is complaining about the other state's use of the water. So there might still be equitable apportionment. Well, that's really what... uh, uh, Mississippi would be complaining about, right? Because it's drilled these wells and it's getting all this water. Let's say that the gravamen of the claim is really exactly the same. They're taking our water. This, the only thing that's different is the mechanism, that the mechanism they've used is one that does a physical trespass. Yeah, that's definitely a different case. And I think it's because there's an additional harm there that I think has been understood. But not the harm that anybody cares about. You know, it doesn't matter that it's stepped an inch onto uh, Mississippi's land. What, you know, what Mississippi is complaining about is we have less water than we used to have. Well, I, I, I think it does matter um, whether the, the state is crossing the boundary or not. That That isn't — that isn't uh, — Well, presumably that would be a very minimal kind of damages, this, the crossing of the border. The damages are going to come from the taking of the water. And the taking of the water, let's presume in my hypothetical, is exactly the same. If the taking of the water is exactly the same, I think there, the, the water would still be subject to equitable apportionment. But one very important factor in how you import, apportion that water might be how the water was extracted. Again, I just want to be clear, there probably is room for a different kind of tort that's actionable because of the trespass. And so I'm not saying that that's, that's somehow, you know, not, not, a, not an important uh, boundary that's literally been crossed in that case. Now, my friend tries to distinguish 
uh, this Court's equitable apportionment cases from this case on a number of grounds. But I don't think any of those grounds uh, suffices. One of the things my friend said was, well, in this case, we have an exercise of uh, Mississippi's sovereign authority. But, of course, that's going to be true in all of this Court's equitable apportionment cases. There's always going to be, for example, an upstream state that's exercising sovereign authority over the water before it passes on to another state. Uh, my friend mentioned um, this unnatural effect of, of, of how the water is moving from Mississippi to Tennessee. But in all these cases, what you're going to have is some human intervention uh, that extracts the resource from its natural state, whether it's the fishermen in Idaho v. Oregon or the irrigators in Kansas versus Colorado. Here, it's the wells in Tennessee. So that, that doesn't really distinguish this case. The mechanism by which the water is moving across, that's not different in this case either. In all these cases, the effect that one state has on the other, the mechanism is through the agency of natural law. So, in the case of a stream, it's, it's just simple laws of physics that if you take water out of a stream, there's going to be less water downstream. Here, it, it's really no different. I mean, the, the, the experts have put a fancy name on what a cone of depression is, but anyone who's ever removed water from a vessel knows that when you remove the water, more water is going to flow to where you removed it, and, and that's, that's simply what's happening here. The one thing uh, uh, my friend also mentioned was the, the pace of the movement. Uh, but the fact that it's moving slowly doesn't change the fact that what we have here is a single continuous resource that moves across state lines. And as Mr. Frederick emphasized, that movement is hardly trivial. We're talking millions and millions of gallons per day. Now compare that to the river at issue in Kansas versus Colorado. There the court noted that the flow of the river varied during certain parts of the year. And in even some parts of the year ran totally dry. And the court said, well, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we're talking about a single continuous river that flows from Kansas to Colorado. Uh, I'm sorry, from Colorado to Kansas. And here we're talking about a single continuous aquifer that, uh, that exists underneath eight different states, including Mississippi and Tennessee. Um, Justice Kavanaugh asked about the uncertainty that might exist if uh, this court adopted uh, Tennessee, in our view of the case, I think it's, it's quite the opposite. The, the approach that Mississippi is advocating is unprecedented. This, this might be a new issue, Mr. Chief Justice, that this court is addressing, but the allocation of groundwater is an issue that's resolved intrastate every day of the week. We, we have state courts that look at, well, how do we allocate groundwater between one owner or the other? And the way they do it isn't the way Mississippi wants you to do it. No one, no one pulls up water from a well and then says, well, some of this, some of these molecules came under the landowner's property. I have to, I have to put those back in the water. No, all, all these jurisdictions apply some sort of equitable principle where they share the water that's underneath them. So I think the upheaval would come, uh, not from adopting our approach, which is continuous with not only this Court's equitable portion precedents, but also how states deal with this issue, but rather in adopting my friend um, from Mississippi's position. Mr. Liu? Yes. Uh, the uh, final sentence of your brief says that the complaint should be dismissed. Should that dismissal be with prejudice or without prejudice? Well, Justice Kavanaugh, we did not file an amicus brief on Tennessee's exceptions to that part of the special master's report, and so we don't take any position on that issue. We view that as principally a dispute between these specific parties. I will say, though, that Mississippi has gotten uh, a number of chances already to seek an equitable apportionment claim. They, they filed a complaint in 2009. They filed the instant complaint in 2014. In neither complaint have they made any real effort to plead an equitable apportionment claim. And so we would simply ask this Court that if it does allow uh, leave to amend in this instance, that it at least allow those new allegations to be subject and tested to a prompt motion to dismiss or motion for judgment of the ple- uh, on the pleadings, just in case we don't need any lengthy discovery or uh, an evidentiary hearing to, well, to resolve They, they presumably did. didn't uh, raise that because they didn't think that was the right box, analytical box, for this kind of dispute. But if we say that, in fact, 
equitable apportionment is the right uh, categorization, why should they be precluded from them seeking an equitable apportionment remedy as a matter of uh, basic fairness? I, I think whether this court gives them a chance to seek that opportunity basically comes down to whether this court thinks enough is enough or whether they've already had a chance to do so. We don't have a position on whether Mississippi is given that opportunity. Our only point is that if they are given that opportunity, that we, we, that this court allow those allegations to be tested promptly because at least so far, the allegations we've seen with respect to injury, which is a threshold requirement of equitable apportionment, haven't, haven't been sufficient. Uh, J- Justice Gorsuch mentioned um, a concern about opening the doors of this court's original jurisdiction. I think one of the one of the underpinnings of this court's original jurisdiction docket has been this threshold uh, requirement of injury. Uh, this court has has consistently required uh, that the complaining state show an injury of serious magnitude that would justify invoking this court's extraordinary authority to compel one sovereign to uh, to uh, stop what it's doing. And I, I, I think here again, um, our proposal uh, uh, would leave that injury requirement in place. And so that injury requirement would filter out uh, many of the cases that simply don't have merit. I think another problem with Mississippi's approach is that they have no injury requirement. Mississippi has not really tried to show injury here. They've simply tried to show that certain molecules took a certain path through the water from Mississippi to Tennessee. And uh, every state that sits on top of an interstate aquifer and that drills wells is going to inevitably create a cone of depression, and you're going to have these claims available. But, but why state. doesn't that uh, suffice to state a harm, in, in at least in Article Three type sense? Um, that the less water available to Mississippi necessarily impairs its natural resources uh, and therefore its ability to to, um, uh, attract businesses and uh, residential units in the future. And uh, maybe it doesn't need it today, but it's it's in the bank for for the state's future and future generations. Um, Well, we're certainly not challenging Mississippi's Article 3 standing in this case. Uh, Yeah, but you're saying an an injury. Um, So why isn't that an injury? Or just an injury in the sense of of the aesthetic pleasure of knowing uh, and certainty that your natural resources are preserved for future generations. And, and, And I think, Justice Gorsuch, when this Court is properly presented with an equitable apportionment claim, the Court would have the opportunity to discuss what sorts of injuries in this context but you're uh, selling us on injury as being a, a filtering device, no pun intended, right? No um, pun intended. No pun intended. Uh, but, but, but now you're, you're saying that that will have to f- be sorted out in the future. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, I think at, the, at a minimum, the injury can't be uh, injury to their right of ownership or sovereign control over the resource. But if I, I, again, I can just I can transplant that. Instead of ownership, if you don't like ownership, how about parents' patria and uh, the protection of natural resources for future generations? You like that? Well, I think they could get in the door, but then the question is that gets them in the door, but ownership doesn't. Ownership doesn't because that that's that's a, that's simply a legal right that doesn't exist. And I think even today, uh, Mississippi conceded that they're not claiming absolute ownership over this resource. Their their point in invoking sovereign authority and ownership is to sort of justify a legal theory. That, that, that would in turn justify the $615 million in damages they're seeking. And, and my only point is it didn't take much for them to be able to allege that claim. And it's not going to take much for other states either because these cones of depression are the inevitable consequence of any well use over an interstate aquifer. And, uh, there's nothing stopping Tennessee, uh, if Mississippi's theory is upheld from bringing the very next suit. So, so it sounds to me like the government thinks that it should be equitable apportionment because that's a better doctrinal fit, but that Mississippi very likely has a claim it can state. I, 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 I doubt that Mississippi has a claim it can state. If you look at our invitation brief that we filed 
when, when, uh, when, when Mississippi originally filed the complaint, we looked at the allegations and said in that brief that the allegations were not sufficient enough to, to plead a sufficiently serious injury. Now, it may well be that Mississippi has uh, injuries now that it would like to plead. Granted, they weren't trying to plead an equitable apportionment claim in 2014, but the allegations we've seen have not sufficed. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Thomas? No Justice Breyer? Justice, Justice Kavanaugh, any further questions? No further questions. And Justice Barrett? Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Frederick, you have rebuttal? I'm sorry, Mr. Coughlin, you have rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Just, just briefly a few points. Uh, on the suggestion that Mississippi does not have the ability to, to show a, a real and substantial injury, uh, we, we certainly dispute that. And the core injury, which we pled from the beginning, I think, is an injury to Mississippi's sovereignty. Um, that's the, the core injury, the fact that Tennessee is acting extraterritorially and uh, usurping Mississippi's exclusive sovereign control over the groundwater within its borders. We think that in and of itself is a uh, sufficient injury as, as recognized in, in Tarrant. But we have others. Um, it's certainly the case that uh, uh, Mississippi's uh, — the cost of Mississippi to uh, access the groundwater has increased. Dr. Sproul, Mississippi's expert, talks about this in the hearing transcript on pages 212 to 214, that there's greater cost because the water levels have dropped as a result of this pumping. So while they may — in theory, be able to get the same amount of water as Mr. Frederick said, um, that comes at a greater cost. More importantly, there's a suggestion that uh, there's no uh, indication that there's any harm to the water. Um, the record evidence uh, suggests otherwise, too. Defendants acknowledge at page, or excuse me, defense finding of fact 156, that their pumping is draining an overlying superficial aquifer. And both the U.S. Geological Survey and Mississippi's expert Dr. Sproul have testified that that's pulling contaminants down into the aquifer at issue here, which is where both states get their drinking water from. So we think that's a, a real and substantial injury. And these issues have not fully been explored because of the way the special master set up the proceedings. Uh, Mississippi did not have a chance to fully build a record on this, on these points, but we do think that there's, uh, sufficient evidence there. Um, uh, Justice Kagan, you asked whether the case would be different if uh, some of these wells physically intruded by an inch in, across the border. Um, and I think your question demonstrates uh, why that shouldn't matter, because even if it is an inch but all the, the damage and the injury is the, is the same, it really kind of elevates form over, over, over substance. And I turn back to Tarrant. Tarrant did not talk about there being a physical violation or invasion of space. Tarrant talked about a proposed diversion of water and exercising control over the water in that case. And I think that's where the injury was considered there, and that's where the injury is here, that Tennessee is exercising control over groundwater while it was within Mississippi. Um, and just, just finally, uh, if the Court, you know, wants to consider applying equitable apportionment to groundwater, which we don't think it needs to answer that question uh, to rule in Mississippi's favor, uh, I would contend it doesn't solve the problem because of the nature of groundwater. Uh, Extracting groundwater has a very limited area of effect, so you can't just uh, apportion it and say each state gets a certain amount of water. Tennessee gets 5 billion gallons. Mississippi gets 5 billion gallons. Where that water is coming from, and specifically with relation to, to the border, matters because Tennessee, as we've said, could get all the groundwater at once, could pump as much as it wants, and have no impact whatsoever on Mississippi because of the nature of groundwater. So I think simply apportioning it without taking into consideration the border uh, will not solve the problem. And that's why we contend uh, that's what the — this is a different injury and, and, and requires uh, a different remedy. Um, and so ultimately we think Tarrant uh, addresses uh, the case that we have here. We don't think the Court needs to pave uh, a new new law to, to rule in Mississippi's favor. We believe they just need to extend the principles recognized in Tarrant the case here. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case is submitted. We will hear all. All right. So that wraps up our hearing of Mississippi versus Tennessee. We made it. <laughs> I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, but, but before that, I, do, I just want to share some thoughts. What was at least I found interesting uh, first is that they uh, make clear that there's obviously this equitable apportionment doctrine.
and there seems to be contention as to whether it should apply to groundwater or, or not. Um, I really liked the argument made by you know the, the second to last speaker, the third to last speaker, where he says, well, in, in states, uh, within states or intrastate, when it comes to groundwater, they equitably apportion it between different owners uh, of the land on the top because they'll drill down their wells and uh, extract the resource. So I thought that was a, a useful uh, example to bring up because it's like, well, if you guys don't hold the standard here at, between states, then what's to say that the standard, that's new federal standard won't bleed in, into within state disputes over groundwater and then you just you know, open the fire hose to new cases in California, Arizona, and everywhere else where there's aquifers that are within the state's boundaries and then divided between others. So that's a pretty interesting implication. And then the last one is the, um, this idea of injury on the sovereignty. So it's like in, when that cough, uh, Mr. Coughlin got the re chance to rebuttal, he's like, there's an injury to our idea that we're sovereign. I was like, okay, well, what do you mean by that? Like, how does that actually affect the state or people? Um, and then he brought up the issue of the cost of additional drilling, which is like, okay, that kind of come, that makes sense. Like you have to drill farther down. But I think his most convincing argument is like, well, as you start to take more water, uh, the, 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 let's say the more polluted water at the top of the aquifer will start to seep or go down deeper into the aquifer. And then that's where you have deeper wells that are pulling out the purer water. Um, so I felt like that was a pretty good argument. So I'm interested to see how that shapes up. So with all that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. We'll discuss this and uh, thanks for your time. So take care.